Satoyama landscape was something that I first heard about maybe three or four years ago after I'd been doing some research on how to build a strong relationship between conservation and agriculture. Because the problem has always been, or at least for the last 30 or 40 years, has been a conflict between agriculture and conservation. So if you look in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the, the leading cause of uh, ecosystem degradation is often agriculture. But then, from my experience of working in Asia, is that farmers don't really want to destroy the environment. They want to treasure the environment. They want to conserve biodiversity. They appreciate tigers. They appreciate having um, birds to eat the insects. They appreciate having genetic diversity around them. They appreciate the water that comes from ecosystems. So why were we having this conflict? That's the question I wanted to answer. And so I worked on that and I collected a bunch of case studies that really showed where farmers were living in a way that maintained biodiversity. And so I wrote a book called Eco-Agriculture. And after that, I discovered Satoyama, which of course is much older than what I was doing, but I just didn't hear about it. I heard about it too late. But then when I finally saw it, I said, yes, this is exactly what I've been trying to do. These are the, the kinds of things that I wanted to show people. Um, this is the kind of, of relationship between people and biodiversity and the whole productive system of agriculture that we needed to see. So when you think about what can a Satoyama landscape provide? The, the number one thing uh, for e agro ecosystems all over the world is water. Because without water, you're not going to be able to grow any crops. So if you've got a forest along the, the top of a ridge or in the watershed, you're much more likely to get decent quality water for the agricultural use. And if you have rice fields down below, you use the water and some of it drains out and it goes to other ecosystems further downstream. So that's one. The other one is that by having a, a, a diversity of habitats within the system, you also are able to keep predators within the system. So you've got populations of birds that feed on insects. If you've got a healthy ecosystem, you've got dragonflies that feed on mosquitoes. So you've got a, the, the um, predator control over pests. And then, perhaps most important in many ways, is that you have genetic diversity. So you have the wild relatives of many domesticated uh, plants and animals that live within the system, or at least close by. So that you have a, an evolving system, not something that is stuck in time and that needs agricultural chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers, in order to continue to function. If, if we look at Satoyama landscapes in, in terms of what lessons might be learned, the, the number one lesson is that we really need diversity in our systems. If we have diversity in our agricultural systems, they're going to be much better able to adapt to changing conditions. And what we know for sure is that conditions are going to change. It, the climate is going to change, the rainfall patterns will change, the economies will change, so people's desires will change. But if you've got the, a complex ecosystem with many different crops that ripen at different times, that provide medicinal plants, that provide a range of different kinds of food, provide timber, construction materials, other things that farmers need, then you're going to be able to adapt to change. So I think that building the capacity to adapt to change is a very important lesson from Satoyama landscapes.
So if we, if we look at the, the major problems that are facing the environment, or the environmental problems that are facing society today, agriculture, uh, Satyama um, landscapes will help to sequester carbon in, in the living material and in the root systems and in the soil diversity, but also builds the capacity to adapt to the changing conditions that are, that are certain to come. And these changing conditions are going to be tougher as time goes by. We're going to have heavier typhoons, uh, more unpredictable um, rainfall, and maybe temperature variations will change. So having these complex systems is going to help us to adapt to those kind of changes. We're also losing biodiversity. But if we look at Satoyama landscapes, many of them are very rich in biodiversity. They have birds, they have insects, they have productive soils. All of these are kinds of biodiversity that all too often are being forgotten. But on Satoyama landscapes, they're actually being saved. And then if we think about food security, poverty alleviation, these Satoyama landscapes or Satoyama-like landscapes that are found all over the world, not, maybe not called Satoyama, but they're often the kinds of landscapes that are occupied by poor people. They're often in remote areas. They're often in, in landscapes or, or soils that are not of the highest productivity for agriculture. So the farmers have to work harder and they have to use the land in a more flexible way. But this makes sure that they have food because they're able to have food that in different crops that ripen at different times of the year. They have a steady flow of the basics of life. They also are able to grow their own medicinal plants so that they don't depend on hospitals that may be three days walk away. So I think that, that Satoyama landscapes provide a healthy uh, living in, in enough. You're not going to get rich, but you have a, a good variety of things to eat. You have medicinal plants, and you have a satisfying relationship to the land and its resources. One of the, of the big challenges that we've seen and has been clearly identified by the, the Millennium Development Goals is how are we going to actually improve the, the poverty situation? How are we going to improve maternal and child health? How are we going to have environmental sustainability? All of these are major challenges and they're challenges that are felt all around the world. In, if we look in, in developing countries and developed countries, in areas where um, development is a problem, Satoyama-like landscapes are a common feature. People who live in remote areas, people who have to depend on themselves, have all evolved systems that are similar to Satoyama in their essence. So mixed culture, a variety of species, maintaining a watershed around, the, egg, uh, around the, the areas where you're growing crops, having fruit trees, so mixed agriculture, having medicinal plants growing in the plot. All of these are survival strategies. They're things that farmers have, have figured out for themselves over hundreds of, of years, maybe even thousands of years, and many generations. But they're all by themselves, one here, one there, one over there. If we have something like the Satoyama Initiative, we can bring them together. And by bringing them together, we build a stronger constituency. We start to give these marginal farmers, as they're often called, we start to give them a voice, a political voice, a policy voice, a, a voice in the kinds of research that is being done in the field of agriculture. And these are all benefits that can be spread widely among the people who are practicing Satoyama-like um, land use practices. I think in terms of, of hopes, what, what can we really get out of this? I think that given the great increase in the capacity to communicate, we, we now have the ability to enable people in one side of the world to communicate with people way over on the other side of the world, learn from the things that they're doing, building capacity, helping them to 
uh, build legitimacy with their governments. Often enough, the problems that these people are suffer suffering from are because of inappropriate government policies. So if we're able to elevate this issue on the, the agenda of governments, then it's going to, to have benefits to the people who are living in Satoyama-like landscapes. I think that we can also reasonably expect to have a lot more information available about how these systems are functioning. Do people have new ideas on how they can be improved? What about uh, new approaches to fertilizer? What about nitrogen fixing bacteria that you can plant with, with um, certain legumes? What about medicinal plants that may be able to help in certain kinds of diseases that may be appearing? These are the kinds of things that may be much more easily um, communicated around the world. And I think that with the technology we have, it won't be long before we'll be able to translate these things into different languages. And not by having, uh, like in the old days where you had monks that were sitting there writing down the, all the holy words, we'll be able to have machines that will be able to, to translate things from English or Spanish or whatever into many languages that will be accessible to the people who are actually living on the land. And they will have access to that information. That's what I would like to see.